So welcome everyone to the fourth episode of our podcast. Uh, our guest today is Sylvia Massey, uh, recording and mixing and mastering engineer from the United States. Sylvia, thank you for taking time. We're very happy to have you on here today. I'm glad to be here. Nice to meet you. Yeah, nice to meet you too. You've worked with some of the very big and uh, internationally known artists like uh, Prince, for example, Tool, and even Johnny Cash. So that's very impressive. Why don't you uh, tell us a little about yourself for the people that may not know you that well? Well, I've been producing and engineering for around, uh, oh boy, 35 years, something like this. And wow. uh, yeah, uh, so I've had an opportunity to work with a lot of different artists and different genres of music. And I enjoy uh, every genre of music. So I try to get the experience of working on all different types of music if I get the chance. Okay, fair enough. Do you uh, have a certain genre you like to work with the most? Or are you open for, for everything and basically try everything out? Oh, I like it. I like it all. Uh, I think I have a, a soft spot for pop music, so mm -hmm. I like to find uh, pop artists with good songs. It's it's all about the songs. Like if there's a good song, you could put it in any genre and it'll work. So uh, I'm looking for the songs number one, um, and then the texture of the music is also interesting to me with instrumentation. So I'll especially look for. Uh, types of music that use unusual instruments whenever I can. Okay, well, that's actually perfect because you do record in a very unusual and uncommon ways, I'd say. Sometimes, yeah. <laughs> yes, I've seen a, a few of your uh, videos on your website and that is actually really impressive, like the uh, one with the Nuclear power plant, I believe it was. Oh yeah, yeah. We uh, recorded in a in a cooling tower at a, an abandoned nuclear power plant um, in Washington State, here in the United States. And uh, that was, you know, if you can imagine acoustic spaces like that, it's a giant concrete uh, tower, you know, uh, like a silo almost. Mm -hmm. And uh, so the reverberation inside it was really exciting. And, and the recording turned out very good. Yes, yes. I'm actually, I haven't heard the, the record yet, but I uh, saw your video and you hit that snare and that was, that was just crazy. Yeah, crazy. You're right. Yeah, uh, some of those places can be very exciting. Uh, and then uh, some places, you know, you think it's going to sound different than it actually does. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and there's surprises there too. Oh, yeah, I bet. I bet. Probably a lot. Um, so... How do you ever like come up with those ideas or how do you how do you get the idea of, you know, doing crazy stuff like that? Well, whenever I can, you know, if I'm uh, reading or uh, uh, just uh, in, in my regular day, I might learn about an unusual uh, space or place that I, I will think, ah, put that in the back of my mind, you know, put it on a clipboard somewhere in my brain <laughs> so that I can remember that for the future because it may have some acoustic property that will, uh, will be exciting for uh, recording. As well, it's a, it could be um, that the, the space is inspirational, not necessarily acoustically, interesting but that if you have a musician uh, standing in a, a certain place you might get a, a real interesting performance from them just by being in this unusual place right right uh, for instance yeah for instance um i had an artist in uh uh when i was working at um castle roersdorf uh, outside of dresden mm -hmm. and we went into the uh, the master's uh, art museum and did some recording and we did it, you know, kind of on the sly. We didn't actually get permission, but okay. we, we, we just went in with our admission and looked at the big paintings. There's a, a Raphael and then we had the singer uh, sing in, in front of the art and the, uh, 
quite special and we used it and it was very usable on the recording, the finished recording, but uh, not necessarily for the acoustics, but for the inspirational value, it worked it worked well working in the uh, art museum. <laughs> yeah, that's that's cool. So you basically just went there and thought, you know, you, you were going to give it a shot and try it out. And it actually worked out pretty well then, I guess. Yeah, well, we, you know, first we weren't sure if we would even be able to get in because uh, we didn't really have permission and and didn't expect to get permission, you know, <laughs> and we weren't really noisy or, uh, you know, rude. We, we just snuck in very quietly and I had a microphone and a recorder and then we just brought it out at the, at the right time and, uh, and he recorded. And then I, I brought it back to the studio and then uh, worked it into the song. It worked great, actually. So Yeah, probably a lot of uh, trial and error there. Yeah, uh, and sometimes you have a great idea and you think it's going to be brilliant and then it turns out not to be uh, so so good after all. Like uh, one time we uh, had a guitar solo and we thought, well, why don't we get the sound of the guitar falling off a cliff? So... In fact, we were at a studio that was overlooking the Pacific Ocean in, um, in Malibu, California, and okay. there was a cliff. So we, we brought the guitar cabinets up to the cliff, and, and then we got the guitar to have a beautiful feedback, and then we threw it over the cliff and recorded it <laughs> as it tumbled down the hill. You know, and, and none of us will ever forget the experience, but unfortunately, the recording when we tried to use it in the in the finished uh, uh, song, it didn't really help. It wasn't, it just didn't work, you know? So we wound up not using it, but because everyone was looking forward to the day when we were going to do this thing, we had planned on, on uh, throwing the guitar off the cliff from, from the first day of the session. So okay. uh, we had a sacrificial guitar <laughs> and everyone uh, carved their name in it and painted it and, and decorated it um, because it was, you know, going to be thrown off the cliff. And so, Uh, so everyone put a little bit of themselves into this project and then it was more about that the action of throwing it off the cliff uh, perhaps as the final um, event in the making of that record and so we'll never forget it but unfortunately it didn't work as far as the recording part went <laughs> that's too bad actually that would have been uh, very interesting to listen to as well Yeah, well, I still have the recording. It might work in something else, but uh, but for that, it was it was just fine without it. That record didn't need it. Okay. Yeah. Well, fair enough. Yeah. But just make sure that if you ever get to use it, you you want to hit me up and let me know. <laughs> okay. Yeah. It was quite noisy. Yeah. Well, that is. Um, <laughs> yeah. It's it's just so random because you as an as an engineer, you have you know, your studio and the perfect acoustics, basically, and, you know, just a dream for bands and, and uh, recorders and engineers. And then you just do random, crazy, and f probably fun stuff like that. And, like, how do you find those spots? Well, I, I am always looking for a place like uh, there is a cave in uh, the Yucatan Peninsula in Mexico, that has a beautiful turquoise pool of water and there's a, a there's a platform in there you have to go down into it somehow uh but this is a place i really want to record um and then there's another idea that i have about working in a, a glacier now okay. iceland has glaciers that you can actually go in they they've tunneled in and created rooms inside the glacier. And I thought, well, this might be an interesting place to record too. And so these, you know, again, I'm always like uh, writing it down on a list. Okay, there's this idea and this idea. And now if I work with an Icelandic band, uh, you know, some musician from Iceland, well, I'll be sure to bring that up and say, hey, <laughs> you know, while we're here in Iceland, why don't we just go over to this place, you know? 
And and I have a, a special rig that I bring to record. And I've got this this little unit right here, and it's got a battery pack. Okay. And, and it's uh, got eight mic preamplifiers in it, so you can plug eight mics into it. And All it's right. completely portable, and um, it interfaces with Pro Tools, but it is a standalone recorder. So I can pack that. This is what I used in the in the art museum. I actually had it under my coat. <laughs> and <laughs> <laughs> and then I turned it on and brought the microphones out just at the right time. No one even knew I had it there. We tried to bring in instruments, and they, they said, no, you can't bring in the instruments. But they didn't check my coat. <laughs> <laughs> and it's called the Mix Pre 10. Mix Pre 10, okay. And it's okay. very handy. Interesting. Yeah. So if you like to do remote recording, um, that's, that's the thing to get. Well, you, you got me interested for sure now with all your ideas. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but are you never um, afraid that, you know, when you're in a, in a cave or a glacier that, you know, the sound, the vibrations will, you know, have it break down or something? Well, I never really actually thought about that, but <laughs> I think we would be careful Uh, if it was uh, in danger of collapsing, then we would be very quiet. But, okay. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but uh, there are places that um, I was scared to be in. One place was um, in Merkers, Germany, actually. We went to the Merkers show mine, which is a, a, a huge salt mine, a very famous salt mine. And uh, there was an elevator that went down into the mine to get to where we were going to record. And then we wow. landed in the bottom of the elevator. And then we took a little electric car through these tubes, the pitch black, <laughs> you know, and all the way to this giant room of salt. And the thing is, is, you know, for one thing, um, we were very, very far away from everything. And we were very deep in the earth. Uh, and so that was a bit uh, unnerving. But the, the place sounded completely different than I thought it would. Um, I thought it would be echoey, you know, like a, a, a big a concrete room. But in fact, salt is porous. So it was quiet. It was actually absorptive. So when we were doing... Um, We were doing some acoustic guitar recording, and mm -hmm. I had mics set up, and I thought, well, this is going to be a big sound, but it wasn't. Actually, it was very <laughs> intimate, more intimate <laughs> in this giant salt room, uh, and that was quite strange, but um, that was an interesting experience. And another time, uh, we went into these tombs in, uh, just outside of Rome, Uh, there's a, a, a place with uh, Etruscan tombs, and many of these, I guess all of the tombs are empty, but they were built, thousands of them, in this uh, kind of the city of the dead there. And okay. we, got, uh, we got to go into some of the tombs, and we found a good tomb for recording, <laughs> <laughs> except for the bats. Uh, we got rid of the bats, and then... And then uh, Then we set up and we did some recording. We recorded a, a song with a band uh, called Spiritual Front. And holy cow, it was not a acoustically uh, interesting space. Well, it was. But what happened with the, the performers when they were in this tomb was uh, so deep and uh, And, and real, when they performed this song, there was something else that was happening there. And it was because of the environment that they were in. And so uh, I had my uh, sound devices and recorded it. It was fantastic. Well, yeah, that's, that's certainly interesting. And I can imagine that, uh, as you just said, that the uh, surrounding, this has a, well, fairly big impact on the artists and their performance, even yeah. though, you know, they might not even notice, right? Right. And, well, you, if you think about it, when you're recording a uh, singer, if they're in a studio, they're going to give you one type of performance. But if they're in a cathedral, 
they'll give you a different performance. And I think that really enhances the performance to give them a, a, a certain space to, to, um, to work in. And the more interesting the space that they're, they're singing in, the less they're thinking about how their throat is not working, you know, <laughs> because singers really are so self-conscious that they oftentimes can't get their, their brain out of their throat. So if you distract them with the surroundings, then maybe they'll give you a different type or better performance. And usually that, that does help. Uh, you can work the opposite way too. You can put a singer in a very claustrophobic place, like a closet with, with no light <laughs> and, and really and make them crouch down because they can't, you know, maybe the, it's a very small room and then make them sing and uh, you will get an entirely different performance that way too. So uh, I have fun torturing singers a lot. <laughs> I see that, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, so uh, you mentioned before that at the uh, castle, I believe it was, uh, that you kind of snuck in and recorded. Uh, so yes, in general, uh, is it difficult to get permissions to record at you know special places like that? Or are people rather happy to have something cool and special happen there? Well, sometimes it's easy. Uh, sometimes we don't expect to get permission. Uh, and then sometimes you have to pay. So <laughs> like uh, the, uh, I did a recording in the London Underground in an abandoned uh, London subway station. Okay. Uh, cool. And uh, I wanted to, well, obviously we were going to need permission to get there. Um, because everything is locked up. And so I negotiated with the uh, transportation uh, uh, division there in London for about uh, two months to get permission to go into this station. And we finally negotiated a price of uh, 1,000 pounds for one hour. And wow. now... Okay. <laughs> And now it was also 400 steps down into the earth, and that was part of our hour. So we 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 uh, uh, geared up with backpacks and all er, all the gear we needed, and we uh, you know our our clock started, and we ran down the steps as fast as we could, and set up on two different uh, abandoned platforms, and we recorded drums on one platform and uh, vocals and guitar on another platform. And uh, we got everything done in one hour, and we we trudged our way back upstairs. Now there was no elevator for us; we had to actually uh, walk up and down uh, wow. to get there. But yeah, sometimes it costs it costs a lot. Now Chris, my manager, he helps to uh, to uh, get permission w with uh, some places. Like we had uh, the uh, recording in the nuclear power plant. Chris actually negotiated over a series of months to get permission. And that also cost uh, to get access uh, to that place. But, the, you know, if we plan our recording right, well, then we have some money left over for these kind of things. Uh, it, it's mm -hmm. all part of being a producer and budgeting uh, in a way where we can do these things. Um, another situation was in Prague in the castle at Prague, uh, there there is a cathedral there in the palace, and it has a bell tower that's quite famous. And we had uh, the the uh, the singer Adrian T. Bell. He well, his name was Bell, and we were going to the bell tower. <laughs> but he, he he actually knew the people that were ringing the bells, and they would ring it every day at the same time. So we did get permission to go up into the bell tower and record these bells. And that was one of the most exciting things that I've ever done. And that again was like running up the stairs. You know? yeah. It was a lot of stairs to get up to the top of the bell tower. <laughs> Good exercise, right? <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, I can imagine. But um, I, those bells must be huge. Oh my God, they were giant. And there were maybe 15 of them. And, and these people oh, okay. were like, pulling the, the ropes and getting them moving. And then they start ringing and, oh, wow. It, it was <laughs> so exciting. That was a, 
a very special uh, time to record. You know, each of these events, I call it adventure recording. Uh, mm. it's, a, it, it's a way to help uh, the artist to get excited about the project. And oftentimes we'll discuss different things that we can do in, in the beginning of the project so that we kind of save this as the, the reward. Uh, okay, so yeah. If we, if we do all our recording and we get all the guitar tracks and all the, guitar, uh, the vocals and, and all the editing and everything done, then we can go have this reward and go have fun and, and do this thing. So it helps to uh, lubricate the, the, all the recording, I think, because mm-hmm. people are thinking, hey, if we can get everything done, we have time and we have a budget to do this last thing. Mm-hmm. But if they go over and they start getting really picky with things, uh, then, then we don't have time and we run out of money. Mm-hmm. So it, it oftentimes will help, too, at the same time to, to keep the, the sessions moving. And do you have a chance to do like a test recording, for example, before you actually go there with the band just to see how it probably works out? Like, for example, in the underground, I would personally expect like a lot of echo probably because there are a lot of tiles that will reflect the sound. Well, you would think that, but if you do uh, close miking, then you have the option of a, either uh, a intimate sound or a big sound. So uh, because of my experience in, in doing these types of recording, I don't do any uh, advanced uh, research or recording in these places. For one thing, like in the underground, they would have charged for that. So we weren't going <laughs> yeah. to do that. Uh, <laughs> and plus, there is always a chance that it won't work. And when I talk to an artist about doing one of these events, I make sure to let them know, you know, this might work. It might not work. If it doesn't work, then we'll just have had this this experience. Hmm. And it, that's enough. Uh, so, yeah, generally, I don't do any advanced uh, testing um, in order, you know, and, and then it just is, is very spontaneous. Hmm. So, uh, so if it doesn't work out, we're not entirely disappointed. Hmm. You, so, yeah, you, you're kind of prepared that it may just not work. And, um, yeah. Yeah, that's that's cool when when everyone is in on that. Why not? That's pretty brave, though I'd say. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's fun though. It's just the the best fun ever, you know. Yeah, I'm I'm sure you guys have a lot of fun doing that, and you know, you get around and see different places too, and that's yeah. that's exciting. Yeah, and and uh, what a great job it is, right? Uh, music recording is the best job in the world. I mean, you know, I, I can't believe it. Some, some of the places I've been doing this type of work, it's a, uh, uh, but you have to build, you have to create your own reality with this, you know, when you're uh, an audio engineer or producer, you can create a, a reality like this, you know, it, it, you just have to have the attitude of not taking the shortcut. Make sure that you never take a shortcut like, always go the long way around if you can do it. I mean, if you have to build a microphone to get a certain effect, mm. go ahead and do it. it. At least try, you know? Uh, so it's a, it's a different way of doing things, I think. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, it's just so, it's just the exact opposite of what you would expect. And that is what really, you know, gives it a kind of mysterious touch that makes it, just really interesting and exciting and yes just just fun to do and probably fun to listen to as well you know i think that the recordings you can tell even you know uh even if you don't know where it's been recorded you can tell that there's something different about these recordings like the tomb recording uh you can hear it in the way it's performed Mm -hmm. that there's an imprint of the environment in the recording, which is a, a, you know, a kind of a a hard to identify thing, but I think it's really there. And technology today is such that these types of uh, adventure recordings can be done, you know, just with a little thing under your arm in your coat. Uh, So yeah, I I hope uh, other people grab this idea and go for it because it really is 
a great thing. Yes, absolutely. Um, now, another question then is how do I or how do you convince the artist to actually go for it? Because I can imagine that at the first time, you know, the artists were uh, kind of irritated when you said, you know, let's go to a tomb or to the underground and do a recording. <laughs> 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 yeah, sometimes, well, sometimes there's an artist that just doesn't want to do anything outside of the studio. And then we have other things we can do in the studio that also include some kind of experimentation with uh, with equipment. And that's, that's okay, too. But uh, if I am planning a session with an artist who is adventurous, then we'll throw out ideas to each other and we collaborate on Uh, what we're going to do, what we're going to perform there, how we're going to record it, how we're going to pay for it if we need to, you know, finance it somehow, uh, the adventure. And, uh, and then we, we uh, make it happen. So it's, it's not hard to convince the right people, but I won't push, you know, if, it's, if, if someone's not uh, interested in that kind of thing, mm. then, then I won't push, you know. We will need to get our work done And that's maybe more important. It is more important than uh, off going off on an adventure. But, uh, but, you know, usually the artists that hire me on projects are a bit adventurous yeah. you know, to begin with. So, yeah. yeah, yeah, fair enough. Because uh, probably wouldn't even make sense, right? Trying to force people to do something oh, they're no. not comfortable with. And, right. you know, there's a a lot of emotions and energy going on during the uh, recording and that would probably just not work out. Yeah, people get nervous when they're recording, you know, it's a being a musician is a uh, a delicate thing. They're expressing their inner uh, emotion. So, yeah, yeah, exactly. You have to be careful. Yeah, sure. Well, very very interesting. Uh, yeah. So, you already uh, mentioned that uh, little portable recorder you have yes what else do you bring along on your adventures i typically will bring some very standard microphones uh usually um handheld uh uh sm58 which is a sure microphone Classic, which is yeah. you know pretty burly and uh uh and doesn't get broken easily mm. so in case Uh, I have had a few things break on uh, on these trips, so uh, I wanted to use some robust uh, microphones, hmm. and they're dynamic, so they're they they take the pressure well. Um, and uh, the other thing is just like a to be prepared with a, enough media to record hmm. is very important. Batteries, you yeah, know, battery picks, <laughs> these kind yeah. of things. Yeah, but it's, actually, it's very simple. Uh, to just have this one unit and to prepare the session beforehand, the uh, program, I program it beforehand so that when we go down, there's not a lot of, you know, futzing around with the gear. It's pretty much ready to go. And that's pretty much it. You know, the, the sound devices unit has been extremely handy for places that don't have on-site power. Hmm. But for other places, if I have a chance to set up a rig, I'll set up something like uh, in, the, in, the, in the power plant, I used a, a Behringer X32, mm -hmm. which was a rack mount, which, had, um, a, which needed power. And they had power there. Well, it was a power plant. <laughs> <laughs> there wasn't would be good, yeah. a place to plug it in. <laughs> Uh, so we were able to record uh, with the 32 inputs on that particular session, which was way more than we needed. Usually the eight input uh, sound devices will be enough for these types of recordings. But there's, you know, sometime in the future, I think they'll probably have um, a much higher uh, microphone count for microphone pre's uh, in these portable units. Uh, and I'll be able to do maybe a string, a string section in a glacier or something. That would be an interesting thing to record. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Probably gives you like a huge oh, sound. Really? <laughs> 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 yeah. So um, how do you actually go about recording? Do you pick out certain instruments, like let's say a 
just the guitars or just the drums or do you actually record the whole song with the whole instruments in that particular location? I'll try whatever it seems like we can do. Like the power plant, we did the entire band. There was a guitar, bass, drums, and a singer um, and a, a theremin. Okay, uh, wow, that's exotic. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and uh, so we, we were able to work um, with everybody together. Uh, but in s other places, it may be just one instrument in the... Um, And we had, a, the band was a, a band called God Damn. Okay. And they are a two-piece. There was drums and guitar and singer. Uh, the, the guitarist was also the singer. Mm. So we, we recorded them separately, but um, that was the entire uh, musical uh, combo was those two together. So, and then in the, um, the tomb, it was acoustic guitar and vocal, which was, not so difficult other places it'll be just the singer or just a guitar or uh, some other instrument like another thing to do that's great fun is to go into cathedrals and um, work with the organist to to record the big pipe organs and some cathedrals like there's a, a place we recorded in sweden in gothenburg that had an immense pipe organ and I brought my recording rig in there and recorded um, the, uh, the, the actual, the organist from the church. We gave him sheets of music and he added parts onto our, our, uh, our recording. And it was That's cool. amazing. And of course, these, these are like the biggest instruments in the world. Yeah. So it's exciting to do that kind of thing too. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, you, you've probably, well, not probably, I'm 100% sure that you've tried out a lot of different things and experimented a lot. Oh, but there's, there's uh, so much more, right? It's unlimited amount of things to try. Yeah, never ending story, basically. Yeah. <laughs> So have you ever encountered any like really, really bad issues or, or problems that just kind of, you know, where you, where you stood there and said, okay, this is just not going to work? You know, it hasn't happened. Really? It, somehow we get through every, every time it, it works out. Um, let me think. No, I think it, it you know, there, sometimes there's uh, noisiness with a microphone or, uh, or a, One time it was, oh boy, one time the digital I.O. didn't work. Oh. And this was in the bell tower in Prague. And we had climbed all the way to the top. And I brought uh, not only w one of these units, I brought two of them and, and had tested it all beforehand. And everything was working great. But for some reason, when I got up to the top of the bell tower, neither of them would turn on and and I could not figure out what it was so I just got my iPhone and <laughs> recorded on my iPhone and it was okay uh we still used it in the in the track so there's always uh, some backup you know you have to be spontaneous sometimes but uh that was a close one but not disappointing ultimately it worked out it still worked out That's interesting because they're basically computers are even almost better than computers already. Yeah. And um, that's, that's actually interesting that you recorded it on a, on a phone because, you know, obviously they're not known for their awesome audio quality. Well, you know, uh, the iPhones and phones today are so tremendous. In fact, I have a, uh, my setup here is uh, so that I can do... Uh, video, uh, documentary video, and and uh, talk about microphones. And I have a little controller here. This is by uh, Keith McMillan. Ah, uh, yeah. And yeah. and I uh, I have iPhones set up. One, two, three. Okay. And I can I can go between them. Let's see if if it's working now. Let's see. We got this one. We've got this one. Hello. Oh, hi. <laughs> you see that, right? <laughs> We've got this one and this, this is, oh, that one's stuck. That one's not working. Okay. 
let's see, I've got this one here because I've, I've been doing a video on uh, microphones. So I've been talking about this microphone here. And okay. what is that microphone? This is an RCA MI4010, which is uh, the RCA Junior. It's very, very close to um, the RCA44, but it's the miniaturized version mm -hmm. that uh, uh, you could uh, use. If You could buy it if you were interested in um, the sound of a ribbon, a 44 ribbon. Here's an here's a actual 44 ribbon. This big guy, oh, yeah. That's but tremendous. they were they were very expensive. So uh, if you if you couldn't afford the the big one, then you could just buy one of these juniors for half the price. In 1935, this was uh, you had to pay maybe thirty five dollars. Oh wow, uh, that's but cheap. The, yeah, but the but the forty four actually uh, was uh, eighty dollars, and in today's money. Eighty dollars is fifteen hundred dollars, and so actually, in the Great Depression in 1935, not many people were buying fifteen hundred dollar microphones. Only only radio stations. So anyway, that so, but but back to the subject <laughs> of uh, these iPhones. The video is beautiful on these iPhones, right? I mean, um, yeah, yeah. They even do four K. They're just iPhone, yeah. right? Yeah. So it's a, it's a whole new world. These iPhones are they're You're right. They're incredible computers, right in your hand. Yeah, exactly. And you know they're small. You just put them in your pocket, take them everywhere, no problem. Yeah, that's, yeah. that's perfect. Yeah, and um, actually talking about those uh, microphones you have now, you have a, a museum. Yeah, yeah. Do you bring those on on your adventures sometimes? Oh boy! Uh, sometimes I'll bring a few, but the the microphones are very precious, and our our museum is has two thousand of them. So you wouldn't we, want to uh, bring all at once, then. No. <laughs> <laughs> but there's some very very special mics in the collection, and uh, and that's what I'm doing. I'm doing a video series uh, that features one one mic every episode and and it's really fun it's a uh, it's called Mike du jour okay so, nice yeah yeah cool actually that's that's interesting because uh well I took a took a look at your website and there was just you know those things that you said were microphones that I had never seen before so yeah that's interesting yeah, yeah. Yeah, there's all kinds of microphones, I, things that I never knew. I mean, I've been doing this a long time, but there's so much that I'm still learning. And, uh, and, and I'm glad to, to uh, you know, have the opportunity to really know microphones the way that I'm, I'm getting to uh, learn about them now. Have you tried all of them? No, no. In <laughs> fact, some of, them need to, uh, some of them need work in order to, to get them wired up but uh for the ones that are working um they 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 sound good in fact i'll i'll give you a sample because i've got one set up here now cool. i have a lavalier on but i'm going to turn down the lavalier and we can listen to this one this is a bk 11a and i have it all you know, that looks pretty heavy it's it's actually it's it's not so heavy but it's a beautiful ribbon and let me see if i can get my um, mic pre going here. You can see I've got this uh, Focusrite ISA1 mm -hmm. um, mic pre here, and um, I don't want to have the phantom power on because uh, I'll hurt the ribbon. But let's see. I'll turn down my lavalier and turn this up and see if it if it works. Check 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 check. Oh yeah. Listen to that mic. Isn't oh, that a nice wow. mic? Yes. Right. Yes. Isn't that beautiful? That's that's very yeah, warm. And it's, uh, yeah, this is a very old mic, too. This might be 50, 60 years old. I think probably 60 years old. Amazing. Cool, yes. And then it's a figure eight, figure eight pattern. So we get the front and the back. Um, and so check, 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 check. You can see, check, check, check. No sound on the side, right? Yes. Isn't that interesting? That is interesting. And, you know, keeping in mind how old it is, it's just impressive that at that time they already you know, build something like that. Oh, yeah. No, most microphone technology was uh, uh, developed in the 20s and 30s. It really hasn't changed a whole lot since the 50s. So uh, these early mics are still very, 
very good. Some some of them don't have enough uh, uh, shielding, so they're a bit noisy. But uh, mics like this, this this was a later version of the Junior, so it it was a uh, very well shielded hmm. mic and it has low noise. And it sounds fantastic. I'm very pleased with that. But eventually, all 2,000 mics in this collection, I'll try them each if I can. But <laughs> it's probably going to take a long time. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so I'll be, working on this. I'll be working on this for the rest of my life, no doubt. <laughs> do you still look for, uh, for microphones? Or do you say, you know, I've got 2,000. I think that's, that's enough for now. No, it's an illness. And I'm still... I'm still buying microphones. It's, it's, yeah, I, I'm always in trouble with my manager. Uh, it's like, he, he can't believe that I would spend money on, now it's Russian mics. I don't have enough Russian okay. mics. So, uh -huh. yeah, there you go. And there's some Czech mics that are very nice too. Mm. The Teslas. Yeah. Yeah. That's a very big and interesting topic for sure. Yeah. A lot to explore there too. Yeah, for sure. So cool. Um, now coming back from our little uh, microphone trip here, did you actually ever go to you you know one of those uh, those experimental places and you recorded something and you said you know like that didn't turn out as expected as, as all, but in a very positive way. Let me think. Well, to be honest, when we recorded "Goddamn" in the uh, the uh, London Underground, I didn't think that it would work. You know, uh, it was very boomy. But then you have the close miking. You you have the uh, option of, of using the close mics and having it a tight sound mm. and then adding the, the room. So actually, it was so good that we used it on the record as the main tracking oh, okay. for that particular song okay. it was an important song but it worked out so well and i honestly didn't know if if it was going to work out for one reason because we only had one hour mm. and we were so rushed to get it done that um that i wasn't sure that we would uh have uh, achieved what we wanted but in fact it it did work out and uh one hour was enough time to do that with one song wow cool yeah that is actually yeah. you know one hour it's not a whole lot and keeping in mind that you had to run up and down all those stairs with all that equipment <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah it was nuts but it worked out yeah yeah interesting and uh if i remember right i think i read that you were thinking of recording a volcano or in a volcano is oh, that right yeah Yes, uh, we were uh, thinking of doing a recording in Iceland. Now you have the option of a glacier mm. and a volcano all in the same place, yeah. right? A live volcano. But, but ultimately it didn't work out. And I'm glad because I believe that that volcano did erupt. We would have been in trouble if yeah. we were on the volcano when that happened. So, uh, but I, w I was thinking, you know, wouldn't it be really exciting to record next to uh, lava that was flowing, you know? That would have um, definitely given you a kick. <laughs> maybe we don't need to do that. But another, another thing that I was really hoping for was, but could still happen in the future, is to travel to Antarctica. Mm -hmm. And we have a microphone in the collection in the uh, in the museum that was used in the first expedition to the south pole wow so yeah so the idea is to take this same microphone and bring it back to the south pole that would be cool and do some recording yeah with it. wouldn't it be great that would that would yeah. be cool so yeah that's still in the works but we've all been sidelined because of the pandemic so yeah we'll have to wait yeah, yeah that is a uh giving all of us a pretty hard time, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so uh, like nowadays, uh, you know, you, you have the option to do remote recording as well. So did you ever choose to do that for certain places or do you always go on the spot? Uh, remote recording now, what did you mean by that? Um, well, Is if it... you basically record my mic right now from from the US, yeah, you know, like, like that, oh, so you're not actually on the spot. I haven't done that. No, I haven't. I haven't actually done that type of re remote recording, uh, not yet. 
because it's much more effective if you're there in person. Uh, I mean, it, it's it's already separating to have the 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 producer and the musician in separate rooms with glass in between, but way removed to have the producer and the musician, you know, on other sides of the world. So uh, maybe it would work in some some cases, and but I just haven't had uh, a need to do that yet. I prefer to be actually in the same room with the musicians that I'm working with. If we can work together in the same space, then the communication is is instant, mm. you know. I, I oftentimes will have the vocal microphone right next to me and have the vocalist standing next to me singing so that we can communicate ideas and uh, I can give direction uh, right away. We both have headphones mm. on and it seems to work really well. Uh, and, and the same with the, the entire uh, recording. Like if I have a group of musicians, I want to be in the same room with them as much as possible when the recording is happening. So I am very quiet, you know, I wear headphones and I, I know my equipment so I, I can get the results that I want. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. From what you just said, I kind of get that you do some other sort of remote recording. Right. Yeah. Well, that's when I carry my, my rig under oh, my okay. arm, that okay. kind of remote recording. Yeah. But uh, yeah, the uh, long distance recording is something new that I'll, I'll have to try. And maybe there's some ways to to make it work and uh, it may there may be advantages to it. I mean, obviously it saves money because you don't have to all travel and be together. Yeah. And sometimes that would work. Uh, but uh, so far I haven't done that. Now, maybe you could tell me what are the best programs to do that with? Oh, I honestly... Um, I, I've never done myself. Like I know I've talked to people that have done it and, um, I've actually on the third episode, I've talked to a mastering engineer that does, you know, a lot of, uh, online mixing and mastering and, uh, ah, yeah, right. He uses audio movers, I believe. Oh, okay. And, uh, that is some kind of plugin that enables the, uh, the listener to actually listen to his session from his uh, workstation. So, you know, there's no, no loss in audio quality or anything like that, but I'm not a hundred percent sure, but that is uh, yeah, that's a, the, a pretty interesting trend, I believe. And, you know, as you're talking about that, I do uh, remote mixing, which okay. is uh, with the people send me files and I'll work on the mix and then play it for them. Uh, and we work on it together long distance. Now that does work, uh, but the actual recording part, that's, that's different. Yeah, yeah. Would be, would be interesting to try out for sure. On the other hand, yeah. uh, you know, I really wouldn't want to miss out going to those places and, you know, recording right, right yeah. on the spot because right. it's just, yeah, it just sounds like a lot of fun. Yeah, actually very much fun. Yeah, cool. And um, then once you've got everything recorded, you take uh, your audio back to the studio and then get to all the editing and mixing and mastering. And um, Right. Do you find it more, more difficult to mix and master than if you'd record it right in the a, in a studio in a clean environment, I say? Uh, sometimes you'll have some unexpected uh, work uh, to bring it around to the quality of a studio recording. But for the most part, I think it's, it's the performance is more important than the quality, uh, the ultimate quality of the recording. I think, you know, uh, a great song, a great performer, uh, you know, with a, you know, recording with this could be better than a bad song with with musicians that don't play very well in the best studio, you know, it's really right. about the song and the performer. So these little things that might happen uh, when you're recording in, in uh, unconventional ways, um, sometimes there, sometimes it works, you, you know, sometimes mistakes, they become on purpose, you know, like hmm. you want those mistakes so that you can just check yourself and make sure that uh, you're not ironing out all the, the fun, you know, and the, the uh, 
the the uh, humanness in a performance. Right. Yeah. That's that's actually uh, especially you know since you can basically create whole songs in an audio workstation, right? Like that topic comes yeah. up quite a lot. Right. So you you don't want to have it sound like a machine created it. Right, and that and that's where I, I talk about taking the long way around, uh, whenever possible. So, like, if you have a workstation and you have the you know fifteen best pianos on your workstation, then you just play, and there's no care. With you know, it's a good recording, hmm. but it's somebody else's recording. You didn't record that piano. Now, if you have the the actual piano in front of you and you mic it and you re, you record that piano you're going to get a different performance and it may not be uh as perfect as your workstation but there will be a character that you you will get there that uh you don't get with the workstation sampling mm-hmm. piano so the long way around is how i like to record whenever possible i mean obviously if you can't always rent a grand piano. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> uh, right. Uh, but whenever possible, you know, we'll try to use the actual instrument instead of mm. uh, just using a sample. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Also gives you a, you know, more and more chances to just experiment with, you know, things like mice, mic placing, for example. Yeah. And different types of microphones. Yeah. Even that. And yeah. especially when you have 2,000 of them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, boy. You wouldn't believe how uh, I'm like a, a kid in a candy store every day, you know? <laughs> <laughs> That's cool. I can imagine, like, there's just, you probably could just go in there and, you know, spot something new and exciting every day. Every day. It's amazing. Yeah. Well, interesting. Um, Sylvia, do you happen to have, any tips maybe for, uh, or, or even tricks for beginners or, you know, obviously now not every one of our listeners has the, the chance to, you know, go to places and uh, pay for admission and bring a lot of equipment. So how can I basically do that maybe as a, as a home producer or when I have a small studio? Well, here's how you could start. You could start just with this, you know, with your iPhone uh, or your phone, whatever it is, and and go out and try some things, you know, and see what you can come up with. You can also, just by recording with your phone, you can try different types of recordings. You could do close miking, you know, mm-hmm. you could do vocals. There's uh, built-in compression, uh, which is actually mm-hmm. very good in these, uh, in these recorders uh, in your phone. So you can try different things, and, and like... Like in the early uh, radio, uh, there would only be one microphone and everyone would stand around the microphone and then step forward when it was their time for a solo. Well, you, <laughs> you can choreograph uh, a group of musicians to do the same thing, you know, and you could be out on the top of a mountain somewhere right. and actually record that, them, you know, with, and choreograph how they'll step forward and and step back when it's their time to solo. I mean, why not try some of these things? Um, Take the long way around, that's what I say. Also, just try every genre of music. And uh, if you're just starting out, record as many different types of music as you can and as many musicians as you can to build up your discography because everybody wants to know, well, what have you done? Mm, So. You know, the more, uh, the longer list that you have, uh, the more they will trust you. And it's about trust. So Mm. you want to build trust with musicians that you haven't worked with yet. And then they'll call on you. Uh, Mm. It takes time to build this trust. So if you really want to go for it, you might want to move to a place uh, like move to Berlin or move to Los Angeles or New York. And if you do that, then you need to, to allow a certain amount of time to gain the trust of the people in that, in that place. So uh, if you move to, let's say, London, plan on being there and not being a, a paid engineer or producer for maybe two years and mm. just 
build these relationships and build your discography and be patient and then you, the ball will start rolling and then all of a sudden you're extremely busy and uh, making great records. Uh, so it, it takes time. So be patient. Yeah, awesome. Um, how would I go about approaching a band with, you know, an, an adventurous recording? Because I can imagine, especially when you're just starting out and, you know, you got maybe your fifth or maybe even your 10th band and you look at them and you're like, hey guys, you want to go to a cave and record? <laughs> well, They're probably going to give you a pretty weird look. One thing you can do, and this may be difficult for some people, but if you're able to finance the entire thing somehow, uh, getting uh, support from whatever, uh, you know, with, with, without uh, record label, you know, money, mm -hmm. but just say, look, I have time in this uh, church uh, on this Sunday. And if you come at 10 o'clock, we can do this recording. I have all the equipment and, you know, offer these things to them. And then if they don't want it, then somebody else will, you know, because people need uh, their music recorded. And especially if you know that artist's music and you say, look, this particular song, this song, I think we need to record and give them a reason why and really be specific. Uh, and then that's where you start building trust. You might have to do a traditional style recording before jumping off the cliff and, <laughs> and doing an adventure recording. But, um, but eventually you build enough trust that you're, you, everybody's like, yeah, let's go do this thing. <laughs> and you can really have fun. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Like you don't even, um, you know, at the beginning, I don't think you need, even need to go to, you know, any uh, paid places or, or big places you could right. you could even run out in the woods and record right absolutely or you could sneak into an art museum yeah, even better <laughs> <laughs> right great yeah awesome awesome but now you're not only a creative outside the studio you've also done a couple of uh, fun and different things inside the studio yes recording yeah see you know so You don't have to be outside the studio to, to do some interesting recordings. Oftentimes, uh, I'll bring in uh, some types of amplifiers and filters to change the sound of the microphone signals. So I, uh, I get very experimental with these things. And so I've, uh, I use filters like um, light bulbs make very interesting okay. audio filters. Also... Really? Yeah, and, and they light when you when you run audio through them, they'll light up. And depending on the type of light bulb, you get a different effect. So the fluorescent bulbs are especially good uh, for and the distortion. How exactly do you do that? Well, you take a very powerful uh, amplifier uh, and you take the speaker output of that amplifier. And mm -hmm. um, between the speakers, speaker output of the amp and the speaker, you insert something into that line. So okay. uh, on one leg of the line. So mm -hmm. you could put the light bulb, you divert the, the line to go into the light bulb. And when you hit certain frequencies, uh, somewhere around 60 hertz, it acts like, a, like an electrical Uh, electric signal or uh, I'm sorry, electric power from the wall socket, you know, 50 or 60 Hertz, depending on where you're at. Um, and so you hit a certain note, the light bulb lights up and then you get this effect depending on the type of light bulb. Uh, the fluorescents are great. There's LEDs, there's uh, halogen, there's incandescent, um, different kinds of materials in the filaments and they all sound a little different. And then the, you take that same idea and you run the audio signal through uh, an electrical appliance or tool like a, a drill. And the drill will start up uh, when you run the audio through it. And you get the sound of the, the electronics of the drill plus the harmonics of the motor running. And the motor will run. Right. If you run the audio through it, the motor will start up and you get this harmonic kind of spinning sound of crazy good for certain types of uh, musical, uh, you know, uh, 
solos or something like that. And, and it's wild. It, it's unpredictable. Uh, it's also kind of dangerous. So I suggest that if anyone is going to try these things, that they're very, very careful to connect all the cables without using power from the wall and then plug the amp into the power in the wall at the last, the last step so mm -hmm. that you're not playing with live wires because it can be very dangerous. But yeah, absolutely. Uh, it's, it's a lot of fun and people get excited about that too. If you're stuck inside, you can't go out and do some adventure recording. Well, you can bring the adventure inside too. Exactly, exactly. And you know, like, it's just amazing. I don't even know what to say because like coming up with putting a light bulb there, that's just <laughs> out, out, yeah. of, out of this world. Well, when you start thinking about it, I mean, you know, there's all kinds of other things that, that haven't been done yet too that I'm excited about trying. And so I've got a list, you know, I've got that, that, uh, that list in my brain there, that my clipboard that I keep these things all um, written up on. Cool. Just before we uh, get to the end of this podcast, now I'd like to uh, speak about the uh, dick mic that you've come up with. Uh, <laughs> yes, I think right? that's uh, something that probably most people can realize without, uh, you know, taking a huge risk. And, <laughs> right. Uh, well, uh, to do, I can imagine. Let me explain. <laughs> uh, what the dick mic is and it's it's probably better to call it something other than a dick mic but you know because of the me too and all that but uh but basically a drummer uh has a drum kit and it's set up with uh the toms in front and then they're on a chair and then there's a kick drum and usually a snare uh off to one side so if you put one mic right in the middle, basically pointed at the drummer's parts. Fun parts. Yeah, fun parts. <laughs> then that one mic on its own can be can capture everything in the in the kit. So it becomes a very good uh, overall uh, miking technique. Now some people call it the gooch. So uh, okay. I've started to call it the gooch mic. It's a much better and more PC type of uh, <laughs> name for for the the mic. But the gooch mic then is is one mic one miking position that captures the entire drum kit. And oftentimes I'll use that mic and then I'll put it into uh, kind of a muscular compressor, and then that okay. will uh, grab that sound and uh, and help it to uh, become more exciting and uh, it really puts it up into your face but it because it's so close and it's like inside the drum kit basically uh, you get all the drums and it, it becomes very exciting so um, that is a, a, a very good technique so whatever you call it if it's the dick or the gooch or whatever the crotch mic uh, as there long it as it works it doesn't matter what they call it <laughs> right right, <laughs> right. And oftentimes I'll just use a, just a, an inexpensive mic for that position, so like a SM58. Again, my favorite, my favorite overall mic is the Shure SM58. And you put that right there and it's just going to get the whole drum kit. And do you uh, kind of use it the way you would um, add parallel compression? Like, you know, to just give it that tiny bit of uh, extra sparkle or, or, you know, that just tiny bit of excitement? Or Sometimes do I'll do parallel. In? Yeah. Uh, oftentimes I'll just run it straight through the compression. Um, mm -hmm. and then, you know, but I'll make sure that I have other types of microphones that I can, uh, I can add compression to later. I don't put a lot of compression in, in the initial track. Um, in, okay. in the drums. I like to keep it open enough so that I can use compression later to taste for that particular mm. song. But uh, when it comes to room mics and when it comes to this type of mic, um, I'll go ahead and just uh, be daring and mm. put that compression on there and crank it. And, uh, and then it'll give that excitement w when we're uh, tracking too, so that everyone can have it in their headphones and hear what's going on. And it, it makes everyone exciting. Yeah, cool. That is a good tip and, and trick to try out. And, you know, anyone can basically do it when recording drums. 
Sure. It's just an extra it might mic even and... be the only mic that you have on the drum kit. And that's the position to put your mic. If you have only one mic. There we go. Guys, write that down. <laughs> <laughs> guys. <laughs> guys, girls. Yes. We, uh, right. We, you know what? Uh, the, the audio segment has way more guys than, than girls. Yeah. And... Yeah. That's why it's the dick mic and not something else. There you, there you have it. <laughs> Hi, folks. <laughs> well, thank you, Sylvia. That was uh, very interesting, very inspiring, for sure. You well, gave Christoph, us a... it was a really great talking with you. Yes, it was nice, nice talking to you, too. Nice meeting you, finally. And uh, thanks for your time. Thanks for all your tips. And, uh, yeah, you, you definitely left all of us with a lot to think about and a lot of new ideas and... I'm sure that uh, some of our listeners will, will have a chance to try some of your tips. I hope so. So thank you for your time, Sylvia. And uh, right. wish you a lot of fun on your next adventure that will <laughs> yeah. come up for sure. <laughs> and I hope that your recordings are adventures too. For sure. For now, now from now on, they will be. Good. <laughs>